I am here with the lovely and multi-talented Wendy Brinker. We go way back and we're gonna talk about the grassroots organizing workshop, GROW, for part of a project that I'm working on. So Wendy, I wanna start at the beginning. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up, uh, well, I was born in Walterboro, but um, my childhood was kind of between Stump Hole Landing and uh, <laughs> Edisto. <laughs> so, you know, I was a kid from the low country. We were country. Um, and, uh, you know, I used to come to Columbia. I, I would think when we crested Hampton Hill and I saw the McDonald's uh, arches, I was in the big city then, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> uh, we moved here, I guess, when I was about 10. And uh, I've been here ever since, you know, okay. occasional jaunts. I know something about you just recently that you had a pageant <laughs> title. And um, <laughs> you gave me evidence, which I really appreciate. Um, I have. But I, but what, what, so I want to hear what your title was. And did it include like a talent? Did you have to clog or twirl? Or do you remember that part? Yeah, I I think maybe I recited a poem. Um, I was first runner up, Little Miss Ellery, 1969. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't know why or how that happened, but um, it did. And uh, no, I didn't particularly have a talent or a <laughs> desire to be a pageant queen but um for some reason yeah and um so I made first runner-up it, it was a good life lesson I guess <laughs> but uh you know my life was very very much just in the country uh we entertained ourselves um we grew gardens we fished that kind of stuff um it was where my family's from. My grandmother used to always joke that the gypsies dropped me off. And um, I so wanted to believe that. You know? <laughs> I actually had a more exotic uh, story. <laughs> I think it's an exotic story. You can't get better than Stump Hole, man. <laughs> no. 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 And no other place on earth like it. So, well, um, it made you who you are. So that's precious. So, Lisa, so you, you came to Columbia and I guess you went to middle school and high school there. You, you went to Lower Richland, right? Tell me about that. Well, you know, I, I didn't go there very long. Um, it was, you know, we were the furthest school out in the district and we had just um, segregated or desegregated school when I was going. I had to go to Hopkins. We rode a bus you know, for an hour and a half, one way every day. And um, so it was a very interesting time, you know, mid seventies and it, it was nuts. But yeah, I went to uh, Lawrence and I already knew I was gonna be an artist. That's all I wanted to do. And I um, ended up, I lived in the art building and Deb Snow, who um, has been affiliated with Grow for a long time, she was my teacher and she's the one that actually brought me to grow for the first time. Uh, we went to lunch there and got a love burger and some sweet potato fries. And as soon as I walked in, I'm like, oh my God, you know, um, it resonated with me. And I just really curious about that place. And then as fate would have it a year later, I started dating Tommy Lightfoot, and he was Richard Lane's roommate. And so I met Richard Lane, and again, we went to the Grow, and it was kind of like, um, that's how it all kind of got kicked off. And Richard um, was going to Colorado. He did the beautiful artwork for the calendars every week, uh, or every month he would do them. And um, he was not going to be able to do a month and asked me to fill in for him. So I remember it well. I did a 
portrait of Patti Smith and Bob Dylan. <laughs> and uh, I think this, was, this has got to be 78. I was only 16 and um, <clears throat> I took it down and I was supposed to get $20 and a pitcher of beer. And I was given the $20, but they didn't want to give me my pitcher of beer. This, this guy, John Carpenter, who worked at the cafe, he was, um, he was a master thespian and very dramatic. And um, <laughs> he told me <laughs> that he would, you know, refuse to remunerate with uh, alcohol. And um, if I didn't like it, it, he made a big spectacle out of it. And, um, told me that I should just cut my wrist because it's a jungle out there, baby. Oh <laughs> and I'm looking around, I'm like, who's in charge here? Is someone in charge here? And they said, oh, that'd be Brett. And that was the days you had to go outside to go upstairs, you know, uh, to, to get up there. And so I walked up to him, this is the first time I met him. And I'm like, you know, you said you were gonna do this. I did my part, now I want my beer. And um, I think Brett was just shocked that anybody would do that, you know. And so he actually walked me back downstairs and got my pitcher of beer for me. And um, he's like, who are you? What do, what do you do, you know, what? what? And I told him I was an artist. And um, I can't believe I had this much nerve. <laughs> and uh, so he's like, well, why don't you come and you can volunteer here, you know, you can do work here. And um, I took him up on it when I got out of high school, before I went to art school, I went down there and um, he told me that they were opening up a print shop and it was going to be called Harbinger. Could I draw a logo for the new print shop? And so, sure. So I went in, I think Elton and Lynn, and I mean, there's just a bunch of crazy hippies around there at that time. And while I was sitting there working on it, Moss Man, Wes White, comes up to me. Um, he's got on his Osceola necklace and the peace pipe coming out of his pocket, barefoot. And he wanted me to take him where the Indians were. <laughs> Do you have a car? A car was a hot commodity to have around there. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. you make a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. um, you get a lot of rides. <laughs> so I'm like, sure. <clears throat> and we ended up going to Sarah Ayer's house, who is like the goddess of Catawba pottery. And we hung out in the yard with her all day long while she baked her pottery. Um, and it was a beautiful thing I it quickly taught me to um not be scared to accept invitations from crazy hippies you know you might have a great adventure <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, do. I mean you know it was a while it's you know decades but did you were um, you did you know who she was when you went I guess he told you absolutely not absolutely no. not I, no 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 if you've ever that's, hung out that's with a real honor um, it was it was but um <clears throat> you know I met a lot so many people grow was like a vortex that, that building it really was in the universe if there was any place that strangers would land you just never knew who was going to walk through the door and and um you know that was the appeal of it, I think, too, for so many years. It was a fun place to work because you, because of that sense of adventure and you never knew what was going to happen. And there was always some kind of hijinks going on, even if we were perpetrating it, you know, <laughs> there was something, yeah. something yeah. going on. Right. And um, beautiful, incredible people, you know. So it was a, quite the perch, quite the quite the seat to so watch like things. some people never had the the pleasure of going there when it was you know at its height when the cafe was going and the meetings were going on upstairs and um what was that what did it feel like when you know well, well it was just it was so much acceptance 
um, it really kind of was like the bar in Star Wars, you know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Leslie was talking about Ray Permander. Yeah. Um, it was um, a group of very dedicated um, people keeping that cafe going. Um, you had Ray, you had Pam Hudson and Pam Holiday. There were two Pams. Um, Cardo, of course, was my main draw down there. And uh, and then Merle. You know, Merle was a slow, you know, it, it took a while for Merle to warm up to anybody. But, um, you know, the early days were, were just as magical. You could go down there and have any kind of conversation you were looking for um, and the art, there were musicians in and out. It's just a beautiful place to be. And I felt very special. I mean, um, a lot of these cats were older than me and they accepted me, they embraced me and, and um, figured out how they could get what they got, you know, <laughs> what I had to offer and maximize that. And it was, it was a fabulous thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they were really but, lucky to have you. And um, the, I was thinking about it. So you were there almost right after it opened and you were there the night that it closed. So other than Brett, I'm not sure that anybody spent more time there. I know you came and went as an employee, had different incarnations mm -hmm. of Grow and Harbinger and, mm -hmm. and then later Point, and we'll get to that in a bit. But um, really you were just one of the fixtures and, and Merle, obviously. So, but at one point, I love it that you actually moved in. So, can you tell me about, yeah. <laughs> tell me about that? Well, you know, as you said, my trajectory, it wasn't straight. It's never been straight. I've always had about three hustles going on at, at a time. And um, certainly that was true back then. But um, no, I would work in the real world. And, um, you know, that was my retreat. That was my refuge. But I had got, I was working at sc and G. I was a cartographer there. And um, this is 10 years before Anita Hill. So um, I was one woman in an 80 man engineering department. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, it was horrible. It was just horrible. <laughs> and much to my parents' chagrin and everyone else, um, I quit my job, you know, and called Brett and asked him if I could come work at the print shop. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of money back then. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to say about that though, the work ethic, because if fr on Friday, Brett would figure out how much money we had and he'd make that many stacks. <laughs> so you wanted the work to be good. You wanted, it, you know, not to have to reprint, you know, you were working for the collective good. And I'd never experienced that, you know, certainly in corporate America. Um, <clears throat> but it was very motivating to me to do my best and um, to bring out that best, you know, just, just to kind of um, streamline and really work efficiently. And that was what was needed there. Because, I mean, you talk about some primitive um, equipment and stuff. It was like bedrock publishing compared uh -huh. to today. You know, I mean, we had um, a plate maker and the camera required a pump. We had one <laughs> pump in the building. It was about 30 pounds. And you'd have to tote it back and forth and hook the, all the hoses up and... Um, I remember telling Brett one day, I'm like, you know, we need some exactos. And he runs downstairs. I don't know, you know. He comes back 10 minutes later and he has me a whetstone. He had gone and found, he wanted me to sit there and sharpen my <laughs> <laughs> That sounds about right. <laughs> no, you're going you're gonna to buy me some exactos. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> you know, we had a plate maker that, put off noxious gas it was a carbon arc so you couldn't breathe and you couldn't open your eyes when you were making the plates you know mm. um <clears throat> brett had heard somewhere that all the old negatives we had if you 
put them in bleach or some kind of chemical that they turn into acetate. And so he sent Merle in the bathroom. <laughs> Merle, Merle came out, he was green. I think he created some kind of <laughs> chemical. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, we were scraping uh, by and um, we got a hard to maintain a life outside of that. So I moved in. Um, I guess it was 85. <laughs> um, someone had nailed a two by four to the ceiling and stole the rug out of Brett's office <laughs> and nailed it to the board. It's like that old Cheech and Chong routine. The part between the two bricks and the tie-dye curtain, that was my room. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I remember and, the and then Merle, was, Merle was down the hall, and what did you call his room? Oh, his yeah, we called it Little Tijuana. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a sac the sacred, hallowed, you know, um, space there. He kept it, that thing locked up. I don't know how many <laughs> locks he had on that door, but it, basically, once you penetrated the, you know perimeter there. <laughs> it was it was a bed and it was about a foot around the bed and then floor to ceiling um god knows what you know what and i forgot that about. he had ruby and grendel as well did were they in the room yeah. or did they yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that was cozy you know, it was it and was then, um donnie lived there as well donnie lived and the little closet back behind the top Now he's got a mattress in there. So uh, it was the three of us. Uh, Donnie was, Donnie was. You said that you were like officially indigent and you got, you were so excited because you could go shopping at Harvest Hope. <laughs> yeah, we were thrilled, you know? Um, it was so funny. People would give us, People would donate things to us. And this one fellow, Charles, he ran a print shop too. He donated this um, car. It was a Cadillac station wagon. And we called it the death mobile because it didn't have shocks. Half the time it didn't have brakes. <laughs> you know, it was really scary proposition to drive this thing anywhere, but we needed it to do the paper, go get our paper and stuff. And, um, you know how many train tracks are in Olympia and no shocks. I mean, once you went over that first one, you were doing this, the whole uh, trip there. But um, Merle, um, I, Michael Lau, I think, touched on the fact that Merle wasn't that great of a driver. They were so impressed out of the DMV that he waited so long. They let him get his license with his hat on. Um what they made yes yes they were they well, let him get his um id picture <laughs> can you imagine being the person having to give him a life to go on that little drive that they make you do which is nerve-wracking oh i've been in the car with him i can't imagine <laughs> yes i can but um <laughs> so merle went to go do a paper run in the death mobile and um the brakes went out so i don't know what Merle thought. Um, but he didn't run into the building just once. Merle figured out that the best thing to do to get the vehicle to stop was to just run right into it. <laughs> Brett and I were upstairs. We thought a bomb had gone off, you know. I mean, we, we really did. We thought somebody had finally just taken care of us, you know. But, um, always always an adventure no that's our... that is true there grow as many things but it was never boring never boring. no no <laughs> so let's talk about um the musical part of it because i when did you start playing anyway how will you um well and... you know i it was actually kind of late in life um not until art school you know and um so I always had an affinity for bass, so I started playing bass, and um, yeah, I 
actually was pretty serious about it for quite a long time. But um, life happens, other things, you know, yeah. come in. But, but um, I was always attracted to the cultural part of the movement and activism and um, Micah. That's, I met Micah when I was living down at Grove. And um, he's just a consummate musician. He's, I play music, he's a musician, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so we started uh, playing very seriously with Glass B Gang. But um, having so much fun and being so inspired by all the musicians I saw it grow so early, um, it just seemed a shame that 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 cafe sat there empty and there were fewer and fewer places to play. Um, But this town was one of the most creative, I will put it against any zip code in the country. Um, The bands and the music and the, everybody was in a band. Everybody you knew was in a band and it was very incestuous. Um, they might be in a band with them one week and then they're in another band. Um, we would do these shows at Grove, these five band bills or whatever. And I was always half the fun is coming up with a new band name. <laughs> you know, what were you going to call yourself this week or whatever? But um, uh, after the cafe closed in 83, of course, you know, we just focused mainly on the printing and organizing um and that was that was it but I just what do you what you are there any shows that you remember before the cafe closed the first time that stand out in your memory well I mean there were all like I said there were a tons of local musicians you had um Micah Susan Nurkia um Ricky uh but (laughs) It was just the the familiarity of the live music and the acoustic music and everything that I think was so attractive to me. Me personally, I mean, I was all about it. I mean, I was a, um, you know, buying vinyl um, from the time I was 12. So I, I was really heavily into music. Hadn't really started playing until later. But um, I... Uh, just had so many wonderful experiences there. I wanted other people to experience that. Yeah. And it was really sad to me that it closed and uh, people just weren't getting that experience because everyone was curious about the building. Everyone, what goes on there? What do y'all do here? Like I said, there are a lot of people walking in and out and a lot of, um, a lot of activists that came from all points um, came there to work for one reason or another. Um, you know, there's, uh, I think some of the first political stuff I was involved with was um, Nicaragua, um, South Africa, trying to apartheid, trying to get the university to divest. Um, there was always something going on. And yeah, I think that that's one of the, um, the most important aspects of GROW was just this place for people to kind of wander in and whatever their interests were, there was something that they could do or help with or be involved with or listen to or somebody they could get to know better because of like mind. So just having that place where people, a a real, you know, the beloved community that um, Dr. King talked about, it really did seem to manifest there. And I know it sounds really corny and trite, but it really was a special, vibe in a special time and um <clears throat> i feel really lucky to spend time there and get to know people like you um, it was my family i mean it really became my family um <clears throat> you know there were people that really were doing their dharma i mean paying their rent on earth you know um that were motivated and very smart and I always felt very privileged to be among them. Like I said, it um, the print shop did a lot of um, printing for 
every progressive group in town, every environmental group, you know, the ACLU. Clyburn used to walk in when he ran the Human Affairs Commission. Um, I remember meeting, well, the first. You're talking about James uh, Clyburn, just for their. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the guy that got the president elected. Well, anyway. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I um, oh, no, no, no. There was a real serious work ethic, and, and it's really interesting because we were paid nothing, had no benefits. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I had forgotten that Brett put little stacks <laughs> on Fridays. It's like literally, you know, literally getting dollar bills. So- <laughs> well, even so, well, I was just hoping that you could talk about a couple of the printers. You mentioned Donnie. What do you, you know, got any good Donnie stories? Because he was before my time. I didn't, I never met him. Yeah. Wonderful man. Wonderful man. Um, Very interesting. Donnie um, loved his bowls. He loved his 40 ounces. (laughs) um, He loved to shoot crabs down on Royster Street. Gave him many, many rides down to Royster Street. But he was an excellent printer. And um, really a, a nice man. Um, one story about Donnie, I had promised uh, a friend of mine that we would have these booklets printed. Brett was out of the country. I'm not sure where he had gone, but he left me to run everything, make sure everything got done. And um, this guy's parents were leaving from Charleston that morning going to drive up and pick these books up and we haven't printed them yet but I knew we had plenty of time to print them and collate them staple them get them trimmed get them ready to go you know we had to be on you know we had to do this Donnie's a no-show Donnie's a no-show <laughs> so I went down to Royster Street that's where I last dropped him off uh they said well no Donnie went to his father's house now, I dropped him off at his father's house before. I had a vague idea of where he lived, but it was, boy, it's a scary neighborhood. <laughs> they got blood. And, um, so I bought two bulls at Royster Street and um, ventured on into the neighborhood. I swear people were just watching me go by, like, you know, because I'm looking around, trying to identify anything that I recognize. Um, finally, I asked some folks, um, where did Donnie's father stay? And they're like, he's right over there. So I went, <laughs> banged on the door and he didn't come. I finally got the nerve up just to go in there thinking I might get shot at any minute. And he was passed out, uh, in the back. So I went back there. I had a joint. I popped the thing by his ear and lit the joint and bullet in his face. <laughs> and um, he woke up and saw me there and he just burst out laughing. Mm-hmm. Who, what are you doing? Anyway, I managed to get Donnie <laughs> back to the building, get the print job done so we could get it out. And we made it, we, we did it. But, um, there were things you would have to do. Lots of negotiating. It took lots of skills to keep that place going. <laughs> um, you remember doing all the printing for um, Trust Us, right? From like for oh yeah, oh, forever. Yeah. And um, the and I remember driving that stuff to like they'd be the curtains like <laughs> up, and I'm like shut. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. And Kay Thigpen is the only person I think Brett was really afraid of. With good, <laughs> with good reason, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, but, but you know, to, let's talk more about the the harbinger because first of all, it was it was the it, you had a union bug which was unique to South Carolina. I, I think you know at the time anyway you were the only union bug if people wanted to to have that on their brochures or whatever letterhead. Um, so do you? And, and again, the quality of the printing um, was excellent and. Um, you guys had eco-friendly inks and things like that. And if people wanted that and um, so I'm yeah, just- Yeah, we did the 
recycled paper, soy ink. Um, you know, it's kind of symbiotic. Um, like I said, the progressive community, um, be it environmental, ACLU, whoever, um, civil rights. Um, it, it was attractive. We would always give them a good deal. And of course it kept our lights on. And, um, but it gave us a very interesting um, perspective that we were able to know what was going on, when it was going on. We put the newsletters out, all the fly, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it really kind of was an organizing tactic in and of itself, the fact that everything came there. And um, it gave me a chance to, to offer what I had to offer, my dharma, you know, um, which was a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, if they'd have listened to us back then, we'd be in a different place now, but we were very environmentally um, conscious uh, in what we had to offer. So one of the clients also was Tom Turnipseed. And um, he was a regular at Grow, and especially Fridays, he would show up with a six pack of beer and we'd go sit on that back porch. I actually found a photo of that very scene just recently, and it really brought back some <laughs> memories. Um, really, that well, was I remember the, the parallel first time universe, that back in. porch, and I, I, I loved it. So, what do you think about well, the first what, time what, what do you remember in, about I, Tom? I had, well, I had no idea who he was the first time he came in. And he was loud. Well, let me, you know, in his, um, you know, way. And, and I pulled Merle aside. I said, who is this foghorn leghorn dude? <laughs> and he's like, well, Wendy, that's your senator. <laughs> I was like, no, no. But indeed it was. And um, <laughs> he uh, always had a good story to tell. And, um, he liked to testify a good bit. So, um, but, you know, there were so many characters that were um, satellite, ancillary, that were in and out, um, but really created the whole fabric, the whole weave of the community. And um, Grow just happened to be the place that they all you know, congregated at. And he said, even if we weren't working on a campaign or we weren't working on something specific, people just enjoyed coming by there and hanging out. Michael Wow, Alden. Um, you know, there, there might not be anything going on right at that moment, but like I said, we, we became a family. We, we took vacations together. Um, you know, we went camping together. We would, uh, it, it was a beautiful thing. It, it was um, not not many people get to experience that kind of thing in, in a workplace. It, it was far beyond that. It yeah. was way beyond, you know, yeah. it was very defined. So I know that um, Richard Lane, also known as Cardo, so some of his stuff is signed Cardo and some is signed Richard Lane. Um, and you had a really special bond. I, you, you mentioned that you were roommates for a while um, and then on and off and um, until the end of his life. And it's just, well, I just wanted A, to lift up his work because it's really very special. And um, mm -hmm. I know how close you were. So I just want you to talk a little bit about him and his art. Well, the thing uh, that, really strikes me about Richard was just how generous he was. Um, he did not have an egotistical bone in his body. I mean, he had a seat for everyone at the table. I mean, everyone, and he encouraged everyone. And he genuinely, he was just such a good dude and a smart man. But, um, you know, the thing that bound us together was, uh, his sense of humor. We just constantly giggling our way through everything. 
And I'm sure we were very annoying to be around, um, but we spent, you know, holidays were always together. I mean, I said we were roommates many, many times um, and just, just had a genuine love for one another. And he inspired me so much, um, you know, probably more than, than I had up until the time I met him. Uh, he alone was um, impetus for me to really take myself seriously as an artist. Um, and, you know, his work, you know, I'll never touch his skill, but um, there's something to strive for, <laughs> you know. But I'm very grateful to every second I had with him. Um, he died at 45. He died May 1st, it was at Beltane, which was a holiday that we celebrated together every year. Um, that was a big, that was a very sacred day for us. And that is indeed the day that he passed away. I sat straight up in bed. It was about four in the morning in a full-blown panic attack and found out later I waited until about seven in the morning and called all my relatives to see if anybody, you know, was in a wreck and what had happened. Never crossed my mind that um, it was Richard. And uh, come to find out, he had he died while house sitting in Colorado. And you know, just a total shock, just a total total loss for me I felt like the last code talker like nobody was ever going to understand me because we had gotten to the point where we didn't even need to finish sentences we didn't even need to say sentences we could just look at each other you know and when you have that kind of magical connection with someone it, it was devastating but um you know we we worked past it and, and he left so many beautiful legacies that we still enjoy, like the bra and the um, Hulk. The Hulk was unveiled at the second annual Mutant B in um, as a, our superhero. Um, we were fighting the nukes in <laughs> Barnwell and, you know, the. Um, bomb plant and I think David Banner got exposed to some kind of nuclear stuff and became the Hulk so that's hence why he was our our icon there and uh, you know you just gotta love Cardo I mean he was smart some of those cartoons and some of his work you can just see how very clever he was and you know one of a kind he really was. Um, and to see the arc of his work, you said it, it changed over time. And, and at the end, it had um, a lot of UFO references or just more than references. Yeah. But anyway, I just yeah. want to share that story that I love about the park. <laughs> well, you know, of course we believe in aliens. I mean, Cardo and I, that was, you know, <laughs> just one of those things, you know, like, Bigfoot alien, sure, you know, we're gonna abduct some aliens and take a UFO for a spin or something, you know, whatever. But uh yeah, we 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 actually did witness a UFO and to this day I I mean it's unidentified. Um we we'd taken our goddaughter to the park to fly a kite. It was one of those days where the sky was so blue. And from horizon to horizon, I mean, it was just the most beautiful blue. And we got the kite up in the air and um, we're looking at the kite and right beyond the kite was a silver disc hanging in the air, no sound. And it was very difficult to judge distance, but it stayed there for about 20 minutes, we all watched it. The little girl, she, she was six. 
And she looked at us and she goes, is that a UFO? <laughs> we like, yep. Yeah, I, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't need any affirmation. I mean, you know, we didn't, you know, um, we were well, What is together. it about kites? Because mm -hmm. since you told, I heard that story, I've seen at least in two of his drawings, somebody's flying a kite. And I just wondered if he like, <laughs> was that after that, that he, or did you ever notice that, that did he have a thing for kites? <laughs> I think it was a windy day, <laughs> and we were looking for some some outdoor activity, you know. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we we experienced so many different things together. I mean that that is just volumes right there of the insanity and the synchronicity and the absurdity of uh, living through all of that time you know but we made it fun we made it a lot it of fun. fun and we had this commonality we both had mothers that were nuts you know oh and um yeah yeah he was an only <laughs> child he his mother was quite older when she had cardo and um his father was ill for years but um <laughs> You know, just crazy stuff like Richard locked his keys in the car or something. And I took him over to his mom's to um, pick up an extra set of keys. Well, it wasn't that simple. She was not going to give him the keys because she was going to teach him a lesson. So she had a pair of keys um, buried out in the garden and wouldn't tell us where. But she goes, you're just going to go out there and grub in the dirt. You're gonna grub in the dirt if you know she's standing there while we're out there digging little holes everywhere looking for these keys. That's nuts. <laughs> it's just crazy, you know. It's <laughs> just grubbing the dirt. And <laughs> a series of photos, she would insist on taking her photo under the American flag. I got a couple of those I'll send to you. Um, oh yeah it was it was madness you know and uh we took comfort in each other's um misery <laughs> you understood each other oh we totally did and you know that was a big that was a big factor there well you were lucky uh, to have each other so but you were there for the launching of point right talk about I was. just when i so was out they pulled me back in. Right. Um, you thought you were safe. <laughs> I think, um, let's see. I had gone to work at a sign company. I was doing some engineering at a sign company. And um, I was working, I was doing some work, some uh, work with Michael Lau when he was working at Greenpeace. And um, so I was doing a lot of anti-nuke stuff, but not necessarily affiliated with Grow. I'd just go by Grow and, you know, take a 12-pack, go hang out with Merle. And one night I did just that, and uh, they were all having a meeting, and I, I looked up, and they, they went, you! <laughs> Why? Um, they're like, you, we, we need somebody to lay this paper out that we're going to start. And you need to come work for us. And it was a, you know, I loved where I was working. Um, I loved my job and I got paid very well. And, oh, it was just something. They put on a campaign. They would show up at my door, call me. So I relented and um, quit, quit all my stuff and went to work at Point. And it was a... Uh, uh, pretty rocky start there when you're trying to do a for-profit paper and launch you know it takes it takes a lot of effort to launch a newspaper as you well know um i had worked for the palmetto post uh when i first went to work uh at harbinger my first interview was drink small i think i was like 17 oh. or something yeah yeah and uh that's how i ended up meeting a lot of um publishers i worked for every black newspaper in town 
Um, I worked for Redfern and of course, Nate Abraham and uh, uh, I ended up, you know, spending 15 years with Isaac Washington at the Black News as editor. So, um, but yeah, okay, we were, you were talking about what? <laughs> Um, you would ask me about a point so that you had back you oh, yeah, know, point. yeah yeah they yeah. were trying to get this thing off the ground as a for-profit thing which was pretty ambitious um especially oh, wow, for anti-capitalists yeah. <laughs> so, like, so yeah so, yeah so you 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 um, took risk and and um and took the job i did and and um you know here again, it was another opportunity to get the word out there, get the message out there. What were we doing? What was going on? There's so many great stories in South Carolina um, that, you know, weren't getting published out there. And so many horrible stories in South Carolina that weren't getting told, that needed to be told. And um, so it was, a, it was a great opportunity. I really embraced it. Um, unfortunately, you know, the original crew and cast that we had <laughs> didn't, didn't exactly gel. Um, uh, one of the principals turned out he just wasn't ready for that kind of a, a commitment. <laughs> uh, so, but when but we were going weekly at that point. And it, like I said, it, you know, publishing was so difficult back then. Um, you were still having to take flats to the printer, map negatives, and, and you know, half tones shot, and you know, four color screens made. It was quite an expensive and uh, very labor intensive endeavor um, to put out a weekly like that. And um, so, it, it, I think we. We went bi-weekly and then maybe we went monthly. Um, and and it, like I said, it was it was a great, it was another vehicle um, for us to use and and had great potential. And I think it did a lot of great stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, I went back at that point. Um, and I think you had come in. Um, I ventured out again, I guess, like maybe early 90s. I kind of started my own sign company and I started dabbling in the film making and taking my music more seriously. Um, so I kind of ventured out and then seems like grow the print shop. You guys ended up moving the print shop, what, out to um Chapin a little mountain no, and we that's didn't. when I said you know no we can't let this let the building um go like that now we had been doing shows I had been doing shows uh there very consistently in the 90s as well you know as well as we started you know we did all the things in the 80s but in the mid 90s um I kind of took over, you know, the slum lady role, and I would rent the building out to groups, different groups. MUFON was one of them, um, and the Columbia Musicians Association. They would have their monthly meetings there. We had psychic fairs there. Um, we had all kinds of benefits to work on the building, get the building um, painted, and, you know, get some stuff done. But um, yeah, and then I guess everything kind of came to a halt. Richard died in 98. And that pretty much ended my foray into keeping the grow open. He had an art studio there um, when I'm was trying to manage the building there at the, the last leg of it. And um, I think in my sadness, I just kind of lost my, um, you know, fervor to, to keep everything going. It was a lot, it was a lot to do. 
But, it was um, a lot. It was, it was, um, it, 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 it we could, because we were really living on the edge, you know, and some of us fell off and, um, mm. it was just, um, a hard, it was a hard thing to sustain. It was fun to do when you're young and feel invincible. It's one thing, but then to mm -hmm. keep doing it as an adult, it's like a whole nother thing. Um, so I really appreciate that you, you spent as much time there as you did and, and your contribution is tremendous. And, um, I hope you know that <laughs> you do. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it was always, it was, it was all about the work, really. It was all about the work and, and the fellowship that came from that. Um, I feel like that was really, like I said, I, I didn't have much of a family and, um, uh, what the grow and, and what, you know, everyone there offered me, I think made me whole. I, it, it really did, um, you know, serve as a incredible foundation, um, for what I do with my life. I mean, like I said, I still try to do the work and, and do, um, what I can, um, and I got to meet Majeska. Um, you know, she was a tremendous influence. Just some of the people that uh, would come in and out of Grow and Harbinger, um, you know, leave indelible marks on you. And uh, real lasting friendships. I'm I'm thinking about the night that Grow closed, and I was so tremendously sad because I knew. You know, it was like a end of a chapter and it's, it was very it's shutting that door for the last time. It just kind of gutted me in a way that, you know, I knew that 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 meant that that chapter was over and it really moved me. But I remember you playing and there's a picture of you and your sister playing and Kevin Gray. And I'm thinking that you've maintained friendships with him, too. And um I, I just really, you talked about it being a family and it was dysfunctional as hell, but it was, it really was a family. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful for that because I was rootless. And when I showed up at the building, I had the same kind of impression that you did. It was like, felt really familiar. And I mean, it was funky as hell, but it was, um, it just <laughs> felt right, you know. I don't, there, it's hard to explain, but it felt like I'd finally arrived where I was supposed to be. Also, left a, a decent job, you know. I was working at the South Carolina bar when I started working at Point, and so I gave up benefits, mm -hmm. and like paychecks, and um, but I that was <laughs> yeah. the best that was the best decision I ever made. So I think yeah. it, it is Kevin called me last to, night. Uh, Kevin called me last night out of the blue to sing a um, theme song from the real McCoys to me. <laughs> Did you know that man knows every theme song from every television show? I mean, it, he really has a pinch. It, it, he can sing them all to you and will. I'll, I'll um, ask next time I get to lay my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Does he have a favorite? Um, ask him to sing Brandon. He likes that one. <laughs> uh, Listen, my darling, it's it's getting late but i just it, do you yeah this is going on for an hour and i promise not to keep you longer than that but do you have any mm -hmm. final thoughts or anything that you want to get on the record here well you know i just miss miss the ones that can't be with us um again um they part of my soul um and just am so blessed and so grateful to have had the opportunity to 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 lend whatever I could you know um I feel like I landed there for a reason and um it's among my stars that I count um so but uh you know, I'm looking forward to what you guys do with the new grow. And can't wait to visit and check that out. And so. Yeah, I think what you and me need to perform. <laughs> I'm, I'm down. 
we'll talk. But that to me, this has been really the the gift of this project. It's been nerve wracking because it feels like so much responsibility to get it right. And um, yeah. but um, it's also such a gift because I'm you know to reconnect with you the way that we have. I think is I really treasure that because we've had a lot of back and forth on texting and and you've been really helpful. So I appreciate yeah. everything that you've done already. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. And you too. I mean, this is beautiful. So thank you for letting me be a part of it. You know. Thanks for making time. So we'll be in touch. <laughs> okay. And thanks for doing All this. Right. Okay, lovely. We'll see you. I love you so mm -hmm. much. Love you too. Bye.